Um, I mean, the science is really lagging behind, um, and I'm going to talk about the law in a little bit later. So that's what we're seeing in terms of children. This is what makes children particularly vulnerable, and as I said before, we don't test rates or amounts in children. We, te we test chemicals by the threshold of adults, which is still problematic, completely problematic, but we don't. This is what makes kids particularly vulnerable and why I wrote Chemical Free Kids. It can be related to anyone, but kids are particularly interesting because they have, and this is what makes them more vulnerable and more susceptible to chemi chemicals. They don't have any, when they're born, no detoxifying enzymes. And yet, they're coming out with 287 chemicals inside of them. They really need to be put on a detox program, really. And yet, they don't have the ability to detox. They will develop it by the, by the age of two. But that, at, the, at that moment, they have got no or very few de detoxifying enzymes. Um, they've got a blood-brain barrier that's open. And it's open, you know, it, it, so the brain is effectively open. And it's open for a particular reason. It's open to actually get as much nutrients as possible from mama's breast milk. It's also open to get as much iron as possible, calcium, etc. But what we're seeing with the chemical generation is that because it's open, kids get more chemicals into their brain than any other time in history because we're producing more chemicals. They drink more food, more water than we do, so therefore more chemicals. They eat more, eat more food than we do per kilo of body size. Um, they live closer to the ground so they're able to actually consume or inhabit a lot more. And they have skin. And this is a really critical one. They have skin that is so much thinner than ours, more absorbable. So things such as some of the skincare products, and we're on, um, I'm over there on 120, on the store 120, but that's a really critical one in terms of skincare. Skincare is absolutely critical that what we're putting on our children because it, it absorbs it. It absorbs it very quickly. And we know that these days with skin, there are more patches going on in terms of medicinal um, kind of drug use these days because we know that sometimes the skin, it goes onto the skin and into the bloodstream much quicker than say a tablet, for example. So what we're putting on our skins, what we're putting in our mouths is absolutely critical. And that's what makes kids more vulnerable are more susceptible um, than adults, for example, and yet most of our tests are around actual adults. The point here is that kids aren't miniature adults. So most of the time, all of our laws in Australia currently measure chemicals by adult dose, and yet we know that kids are completely different. They're completely different little beings as to how they absorb um, and metabolise chemicals. Um, but they're treated often in terms of policy like they're just little ones of us, little miniature ones of us, which is actually not the case at all. Roots of exposure, most of you would know all of these. It's got the skin, the digestive system, breast milk, um, Core, the cord, the placenta is a really significant one, the respiratory system. So all of those are roots of exposure. Can our bodies eliminate them? Well, our bodies are really clever. Um, and for adults, we can eliminate some chemicals and we can eliminate quite a lot of chemicals. Sometimes it will take a lifetime to eliminate that chemical. Some chemicals won't ever be eliminated. Sometimes like phthalates or BPA, they'll get out of our system relatively quickly, um, within 24 hours, 12 hours, 48 hours, for example. Um, other chemicals stay in, in particular, our bones, fat cells, so we've got chemicals such as D, that's why I can pass DDT or pesticides onto my children because I've got it stored in my fat cells. So I just actually just get it passed on to my children, they pass it on to theirs. Anything that's fat soluble is very difficult to actually get out of our bodies, for example. And they can actually stay there for years or generations. Other, other, other chemicals damage a specific organ. So some of the people who I work with in the chemical industry will say, well, phthalates or BPA leave our system really quickly. But you know, it doesn't necessarily matter. It can actually mean that it can also have a damaging effect on our liver on the way through. It's like the saccharins or the sucroses and so forth. You know, that does havoc on our kidneys as it goes through. It leaves our body relatively quickly, but it plays absolute havoc on our kidneys and livers and so forth. So some can actually be stored in different parts of our bodies as well. Or as I said before, something like fluoride can actually have an additive effect. You know, one of the issues around fluoride, and we just introduced it what, last year in Queensland, um, but we can't um, regulate how much fluoride. People will say, you can have this much fluoride, for example, but if we've got children having a lot more water than adults, for example, or we're adding it to their baby bottles, for example, or we're cooking with it, we don't have a measurement for being able to measure how much we're able to actually have. So some can accumulate um, and some can have that kind of additive effect, which is 
you know, why we often can't eliminate it very quickly and why detox programs take quite a long time. Why are we still consuming these chemicals? Tingle actually did this research years ago and he's actually re updating it and it, this really hasn't changed at all. Most of the time we trust the food industry, we trust the chemical industry, we trust the multi, we trust media. You know, most of the time we, we, we believe all of these things. I did, before I started doing this research when I was growing up, I thought that the, the government must regulate our food products you know, otherwise it wouldn't be on the shelf. I just generally had that idea and belief that it wouldn't be on the shelf unless it's been tested. We now know that it hasn't been tested. I'm going to go show you some research a little bit labels. We believe that most labels are accurate, which is not the case. I'm going to show you that a little bit later as well. But that's why we can actually have chemicals actually in our, in our system still. In terms of chemical production, it's increasing dramatically. We have over 100,000 chemicals. Um, on our books in Australia, about 45,000 of them are industrial chemicals, um, 15 new, 1,500 new products produced each year. So, and in terms of volume, 1930s, 1 million tonnes. These days, over 400 million tonnes produced. So we're just consuming that many more chemicals than any other time in history, really. Every six hours, a new chemical is actually produced. Do you think that they're all tested? Do you think we've got the regulatory kind of agencies to do that? Well, we don't. I'm going to show you this one's from the EWG. Women use on average 12 personal care products a day. Guess how many products or guess how many chemicals that might expose us to? Any ideas? And probably not most people here would, would we probably might use 12, but most people here would have a bit more of a consciousness. But when I'm doing workshops, you know, they're actually getting on average 160 chemical ingredients. And that's just that first 10 minutes or 20 minutes in the morning with your makeup. You, you, you know, your washing regime and so forth. Men actually get half because they only use actually half the personal care products we use. But that's also increasing with the marketing. Men are using more personal care products than any other time in history as well. In terms of the law, like why we're able to allow products on the market, the law, the law doesn't work under a precautionary principle. The precautionary principle kind of operates like, let's test Let's um, get the manufacturers to give us the testing and the research before we release it into the environment, before we release it into the market. We don't operate like that. That's a really sensible way of operating, isn't it? Well, it would really slow down ca capitalism if we actually did that. So what we do is that we allow chemicals out there and then we, pro we proceed and, until, caution, until it's actually proven that they are actually harmful. So there's a certain amount of acceptable risk. Proceed until danger is proven, unfortunately. And that's how our current law operates. So people will often say, well, surely there can't be too many. But when you actually look at the law, it's kind of reverse. It's kind of problematic because we're actually putting chemicals out there and then we're actually doing the tests. It's very hard to get chemicals off the market once they're on the market. And, and the tricky thing around chemicals is that everyone's body is different. It metabolises differently. So I might use a sunscreen and it might be fine on my, I don't see any effects or anything. Someone else's body's quite different. They might use a, a, you know, that same sunscreen and get dermatitis, for example. Or someone might use a, a shampoo and it gives them respiratory problems. Someone might be fine using it, for example. We've all got different thresholds. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not having harm. We just can't see it on a cellular level, for example. So in that case, it's very hard to prove to government because it's very, it's very hard to show a cause and effect. Cancer is a classic example of that. You know, there's probably multiple, there is multiple, you know, kind of reasons why we're developing cancer. But, you know, for us to say, this is a cancer-causing agent, get it off the market, they're kind of like, well, it causes cancer maybe in some animals, but not other, not other animals, for example. So it's really difficult, unless we can actually prove cause and effect, it's very difficult to actually get, get them off the market. Bindi's were a really good example of that. Has anyone heard of Bindi's? They're, they were put on the market years ago, about five years ago. They're kids' play toys, so they're little round dots, they're plastic, you put them together, you spray them and they produce like little pictures. We found when I was working at the Royal Children's Hospital, we had a couple of little guys come in who had ingested it, which is pretty normal for kids to actually swallow things. What happened though is that they were, they, they were ingested. Um, the, the actual chemical um, metabolised to a product called GHB, gamma hydroxybutyrate. On the dance scene, it's known as fantasy or G. Mm -hmm. And so we had uh, one fatality and we had a couple of really high kids.